Well, in this podcast, I'm going to move into round two of what I used to describe as my essay writing boot camp. Um, I've gotten your FRQs. You'll have my grades soon, but I'm still going to move on to the DBQ. So approaching the DBQ, you, the first thing you need to realize is that the primary requirements are really the same as you confront with the FRQ. So you still need a strong thesis. Don't just restate the prompt. Ideally, you want something with some analytical depth. I talked about that before. You want substantial supporting historical detail that goes beyond the documents. By the way, if you took AP European history last year, you need to know that the College Board grading rubrics for the U.S. History DBQ are quite different. With the European History DBQ, you're really expected to find most of the information you need in the documents. And in fact, they often deliberately select a somewhat obscure topic and look to see what you can make of the documents. This is not what happens with the U.S. History. In the case of the U.S. History DBQ, you're expected to include a good deal of analytical information that is not in the documents. Really, you're trying to demonstrate that you understand where these documents belong. Uh, the graders will have pages of possible information that you could put in your essay. Some of that needs to be in your essay. Again, it's good to relate your analysis to major movements in American history. The College Board had a reason for asking the question that does. It thinks it's a big picture question. Try to give some indication in your essay that you understand that. Uh, and finally, as always with this and any other AP essay, you want a clear organization. You want to signal that organization in your opening paragraph. Uh, you want each paragraph to be organized around a topic sentence with a unifying theme. And by the way, this is actually harder to do with DBQs than it is with FRQs because the documents can lead you astray. It's very tempting to end up taking your reader on essentially a tour of the documents and to lose your paragraph unity. In other words, well, we're going to talk about social issues here and we've got five documents that might be about social issues, so we're just going to shoehorn them in. That's very tempting. I'm going to try to encourage you to avoid that temptation. Uh, which leads me to the fact that the DBQ does present some additional challenges. That's why it's a longer essay than the FRQ. Um, above all, the College Board is looking to see that you understand historiography. Now, I don't know if you've encountered that term before. Uh, let me explain it a little bit. Uh, I looked it up on the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, and here's the definition. Historiography is the writing of history based on, I'm going to, put emphasis on these words, critical examination of sources, the selection of particulars from the authentic materials, and the synthesis of particulars into a narrative that will stand the test of critical methods. In other words, how do you use sources critically to figure out what actually happened. This is how real historians write history. They do not just read other people's history books, although they do a lot of that too. Uh, they're more really more like CSI forensic scientists. Uh, they're sifting through data and they're trying to reconstruct what happened from a lot of different witnesses, a lot of different evidence, some of which is almost certain to be contradictory. And then they use that information they've found selectively to reconstruct their own narrative. Uh, you can't do all of this in 45 minutes, but you can demonstrate that you have some idea of how it's done. The best way to, gra to demonstrate a grasp of historiography is to show some understanding of the documents that these snippets were taken from. To show that you have some concept of who these individuals involved were, the context that shaped their opinions, the historical events that were going on in the background, and especially, and this again, if you took European history, you'll remember as point of view, uh, you want to demonstrate that you understand ways in which they may be biased or even flat wrong. Okay. I have never encountered a DBQ that did not make me want to tear out my hair. And don't get me wrong, I like the DBQ. I like that the College Board insists that you learn to read original documents instead of just regurgitating a textbook, but I always find myself a little baffled and often more than a little frustrated by the documents the College Board chooses. They have their little ways, and we have to live with them. And this DBQ, to my mind, is a prime example. Again, it's an excellent question. 
The question of whether the American Revolution was really, if you will, a revolution, whether it really did turn the world upside down, was it truly a fundamental change? This is actually a very, very big question among historians of America. Uh, and there are some historians, I remember encountering this view when I was in college, there are historians who claim that the American Revolution wasn't a revolution at all, uh, that to that America would have to wait for the Civil War to have a real revolution, and that is a revolution as defined as a real change in society and, a re and the political regime. Uh, so if I had 10 minutes to think about this question before I saw the college board's documents, I'm pretty sure that I would formulate a thesis uh, about the democratization of society that was driven on the one hand by the revolutionary principles, all men are created equal, and the long-term implications of that were enormous, uh, combined with the exigencies of revolutionary war. War tends to be a leveling experience. This has happened throughout history. And by the way, showing some understanding of how patterns that emerged from the revolution repeated themselves throughout history, give you a hint, talking about the role of women, this would be a good thing to do, uh, would be appropriate. You'll be better able to do that obviously at the end of the class. Uh, if looking at the revolution's econ uh, economic consequences, I would be inclined to write about the opening of the Western frontier, the challenges that the incredible expansion of the debt posed for the new government and for many Americans, uh, the opportunities and difficulties both that were created by severing economic ties with Britain. Uh, I talk about the ways the revolutionary principles drove the country toward greater equality and looking at political consequences. I think I'd be inclined to address the question of whether Americans really set out to create a new kind of political regime or whether they were, as they claimed they were at least initially, uh, just trying to recreate what they imagined to be the fundamental rights of Englishmen. In other words, to restore rather than to revolutionize. And whatever they may have set out to accomplish, did they, in fact, create something new under the sun? Okay, that's what I think I would think about. And then I'd open the document pa package and see the documents about Tories, Indians, slaves, women, religious liberty, and I guess agriculture. Uh, the only document that easily and clearly fits into my thesis uh, or at least the thesis swimming around in my mind, is document I from the Federalist Papers. And I guess there would be some support for my point about equality. Still, I would probably need to rethink my whole approach. Oops. Uh, so, okay. Oops, here we go. Sorry, my slide didn't want to change. Uh, the College Board has now reminded me that I'm thinking too much about history is written, made and written by boring old uh, white men, or actually in this case, surprisingly young white men and not particularly boring. Still, it's a fair critique, although I'd be inclined to throw right back at the College Board that these were, after all, the folks that led the country into revolution. But guess what? I don't get to talk back to the College Board, and neither do you. So we're stuck with the question, and we're stuck with the documents they've thrown at us. And you have, if it's an actual AP exam, 15 minutes to determine your thesis, which means that you don't want to spend 10 of those minutes thinking about what you would answer before you even saw the documents. Nevertheless, I still recommend that before you look at the documents, you spend at least a minute thinking quickly. How would I answer this question if I just had to answer it as an FRQ? And the reason I suggest that, and again, this is a take-home essay, so it isn't going to be immediately relevant, but the reason I suggest it is it may help keep you on an analytical track because it's easy, easy to get distracted by the documents. Having said that, you only get a minute or so, and then you need to dive into the documents, and what you need to figure out is the best argument the strongest thesis you can construct with the documents you're given. But you still want to keep thinking about that central question, which is whether the revolution did or did not fundamentally change American society. Um, and you also know, based on the question, that you probably want paragraphs that are talking about social, economic, and political changes, which gives you some organizational principle for looking at the documents. Where do they belong? At the same time, you want to give a more overarching uh, answer to the question. You don't want to say the revolution created social, political, and economic changes. And by the way, I've seen a lot of student essays that did just that. Don't. Have a thesis. So 
Is your thesis, yes, American society was fundamentally transformed by the American Revolution? Or is it, yes, uh, some aspects of American society were transformed, or American society was partly transformed or transformed in some important ways, but in other ways it continued to resemble pre-revolutionary society. Or maybe your thesis is actually, no, American society was only superficially transformed. Post-revolutionary society still looked a whole lot like pre-revolutionary society. So... You've got the documents, and you're going to answer those questions for yourselves, armed with the other history you've been learning. Uh, and I'm going to talk about these issues with you and the documentary support for your thesis when we get together in class. Uh, for now, let me close by just offering a few more tips about writing any DBQ. Okay, you heard this before with the FRQ. It continues to remain, in, in some ways, my most important advice about approaching any AP question, which is read the question carefully and think about what they're actually asking. I know it sounds obvious, but I have seen an awful lot of mis essays where students make the mistake of not taking the step. So, so what are the key words in this question? I would argue that the most important word is fundamentally. So what is the difference between change and fundamental change? So, for example, I can change my appearance. I can comb my hair. I can put on some makeup. I can decide to wear a dress instead of jeans or jeans instead of a dress. But those, I would argue, are probably not fundamental changes in my appearance. Nobody's going to pass me on the street and fail to recognize me if I do those things. So how do I fundamentally change my appearance? Do I pay for plastic surgery? Do I get a gym membership and start working out all the time? Uh, do I go buy some chemical enhancers and try life as a redhead? What does it mean to fundamentally change society? Uh, another question is, what is the difference between social, political, and economic? What do those terms mean? Uh, you know, at first reading, it may seem obvious, and the College Board may have thought it was. I actually think those distinctions are a little tricky. So just to give one example from one of your documents, slavery uh, is not allowed to spread into the Northwest Territories. A very, very important decision was that was made, really arguably the most important thing that the government under the Articles of Confederation did. So what kind of a change is that? Is it social, political, or economic? I, I would say it's really all of the above. It changed the the prospects for some African Americans, the balance of power, political balance of power between slave owners and non-slave owners is going to dominate uh, American political history for the next 100 years or the next 80 years at least. Uh, economically, it's going to have important consequences, although you could also argue that it was a recognition of economic reality. Slavery just wasn't really practical in those territories. The point is it's not always easy, but you're going to have to look at those documents and either try to, to shoehorn them into categories or, and this is not a bad idea, uh, to sometimes use the same document in more than one category. And finally, you need to think about time period. And actually, the time period of this is trickier than you might think. The question asks about the American Revolution, but the time period you're expected to cover goes from 1775, that's Lexington and Concord, to 1800. What happens in 1800? That's actually the election of Thomas Jefferson. So we're talking about not only the entire Revolutionary War, but the entire era that might be considered the founding era. Uh, that's a big period of time. And if you don't cover at least some of those post-Revolutionary War events, uh, you're going to lose out in the scoring rubric. Stay focused on the revolution. Um, I've graded this essay for several years, and this is a mistake uh, that I saw in a lot of students' essays. Okay, yes, the question takes you up to Jefferson. It talks about Indians. It talks about women. It talks about slaves, at least if that's what the document suggests you want to talk about. But the question asks you about the consequences of the revolution, and you want to, in debate terminology, keep linking back to that topic. So, for example, if the situation of women or slaves has changed during this 25-year period, what did the revolution have to do with this change? If the perceived political challenge facing the new country has changed, what did the revolution have to do with this? Stay focused on the question. It'll help give your essay analytical power, and it'll keep you from rambling all over the place. Approach sources critically. Every document will express some point of view. 
So ask yourself, and if again, if you took European history, you've had some practice with this. It's point of view. How does the individual's political philosophy or gender or race or circumstances affect this perspective? How reliable is this source? Uh, by the way, a good way to think about this, I think, is to check out the Indian documents, C&E. Who are the people who've written or, or are recorded in these documents? Pardon the dogs barking in the background. Uh, what's really going on here? What are the economic as well as social consequences of the changes that these documents highlight? Uh, you can't analyze every single document. You aren't going to have time. But if you can throw in some serious critical analysis of at least a couple of documents, I think your essay is going to stand above many others. Okay, integrate your sources smoothly. Now, I assume that a lot of you are taking the AP Language and Composition exam um, where you'll be working on this. It's a very useful skill. Um, and let me just throw out a, a few hints about this. As I said, you're probably working on this in your English class. Never say document A says or according to document A. Introduce the source, the author, the source, you know, if it's a legislative document, the bill, whatever, its perspective, how it relates to and supports your thesis, and then put the document letter in the end. You do want to do that, by the way, because it helps your grader keep score. And, and one rule of AP essays is you always want to make life easy for your poor, beleaguered, tired grader. You want him or her to think highly of you, right? Also, do not just plop down long quotes. Think about how you can integrate the information, maybe some quotes, smoothly. Now, uh, when I taught AP Language and Composition, I assigned an essay called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And one of the reasons I assigned it is I thought that the author did an unusually good job of using lots of sources and integrating them smoothly. And I will go ahead and send a URL for this to Mr. Baca. Uh, he can share it with you. I actually probably should have put it in the slide just in case you want to look this up. But here's an example. Here's a paragraph that I included uh, that I thought was well done. So, uh, Bruce Friedman, who blogs regularly about the uses of computers and medicine. Notice that's a smooth and interesting way of introducing the source has also described how the Internet has altered his mental habits. And then you have a quote. I now have almost totally lost the ability to read and absorb a longish article. Oops, I left out the end. On the web or in print, he wrote earlier this year. A pathologist who has long been on the faculty of the University of Michigan. Note we have a little more information about the guy. Friedman elaborated on his comment in a conversation with me. His thinking, he told me, has taken on a staccato quality. By the way, I particularly like the way the author took just one word out of the conversation and used as a quote. Again, too many student essays will just take a chunk of text and throw it in without analysis, without explanation. It looks like filler. Anyway, you can read the rest of the quote here, and I'll send a link to the article. But this is an example of a smoothly and well-integrated quote. Move beyond the documents. And again, remember that a very important part of the College Board's grading rubric for this is how much outside information you use. But by all means, use the documents to give you a hint about the outside information. So, for example, you have a quote from Abigail Adams. It's not the famous one talking about remember the ladies, but there's no reason why you couldn't make a reference to that. And what, what's the significance that a woman is entering into the political discourse anyway? But that document itself is actually more about the political and economic situation. You should talk about that as well. You have a short quote from the Federalist Papers. What was the entire problem that the Federalist Papers was written to address? What's going on here? What political circumstance does the country find itself in in the wake of the revolution? And to return to our question, how is that itself in part the result of a revol the revolution? I'll drop a hint here. Uh, first drafts of student essays very seldom talk about the debt facing the country. And I'm going to show my bias, which is an interest in uh, economics, but that's something you might think about. Uh, what is the post-war predicament facing Indians? Uh, and what opportunity now confronts settlers as well, which is really the, ta the subtext, the, the context, I should have said, for those Indian quotes. But you wouldn't necessarily pick that up from the quotes. You need to, to contribute that yourself. You see the Northwest Ordinance, but what are the future prospects for slavery and for the anti-slavery movement? And again, what does the revolution have to do with it? Those are all opportunities that the documents themselves give you 
to give additional outside information. Okay, you've gone through the documents. Return to the question. Has your answer changed? Now, in the actual AP uh, test, and I hate to give this advice, but generally speaking, if you've got a thesis and you move forward with it, even if you're two-thirds of the way of your S through your essay and you decide that you are probably wrong, this is not the time to confess it. Finish your essay. Oh, you can change your mind in your next essay. But here, after you've looked at the documents and you've presented a thesis, you actually have an opportunity to go back and rethink your thesis, which is how real college writing is done, which is how good writing is done. You have an idea as you go in, you look at the documents, you investigate, uh, and then you Think about whether your answer has changed. Actually, we call that the scientific method. It's also called thinking clearly. Look forward to seeing you soon.